Have you ever wondered why some people hate, and I mean hate, police officers? Have you ever wondered why some people become enraged at the entire police force and the entire criminal justice system when a particular officer kills someone? Have you ever wondered why some people are so angry that they want to abolish police entirely? I know why. I know exactly why. But I find that the people who are protesting and even rioting haven't done a very good job of getting people who disagree with them to understand why they're so angry. And that's a problem, because if the rest of the country doesn't understand why some people hate police officers, they'll never be able to deal with the underlying problem. Now, whatever your position on the protests and riots, there is an ongoing source of anger and rage and resentment that needs to be dealt with, and which can be dealt with, but which won't be dealt with if people don't understand what the problem is. Fortunately, you're watching this video, and if you watch this video till the end, you'll finally get it. In fact, I suspect that I'm going to explain this more clearly than anyone has ever explained it to you, because I have a knack for breaking this stuff down. Hear me out and tell me in the comments section if I'm right or wrong. Of course, if you're new here and you don't know my background, you may be wondering, David, what could you possibly know? Sitting in front of your books? Freaking nerd? Well, let's just say that I've been a dear member of some very different communities during my life. I have multiple bachelor's degrees, multiple master's degrees, and a PhD in philosophy. I've also been in multiple jails, multiple prisons, and multiple mental hospitals. I have friends who are philosophers and historians. I also have friends who are armed robbers and drug dealers. Retired, of course. I grew up in a West Virginia trailer park. That's the ghetto for hillbillies. I also lived for 13 years in the happiest place in the world, the Bronx. Very different communities. And I've been everywhere in between. My first encounter with the police took place when I was a fetus. I'm not joking. My mother was with a group of young troublemakers who tried to burn down a police officer's house. One of them shot a gun into the house, but didn't hit the police officer. He hit a toddler in a high chair, just in the leg though. My mom was only 15 years old and she didn't do any of the shooting or arson. And she was always extremely good at playing dumb when she was in trouble. So she only got probation. A few months later, while I was still in my mother's womb, I was in a drug bust. My mom tried holding the door closed so my dad, who was a dealer at the time, could stuff his stash down a vent. Wasn't a very good hiding spot. My dad got busted for dealing drugs. My parents were only together until I was two, lived with my mom. She never graduated from high school. For some reason, she always ended up with violently abusive boyfriends. One of my earliest memories is waking up to the sound of screaming, walking into the kitchen, seeing my mom with blood all over her face, and standing there while she tried to convince me that it was ketchup, as if a four-year-old prodigy can't tell the difference between blood and ketchup. Another of my earliest memories was of being in the back of a police car with my mom. I don't remember what the situation was, but I remember that the police officer was taking us someplace safe after some sort of violent altercation with some boyfriend. My mom and dad, for the most part, got their lives on track for a while, but it didn't last forever. My dad eventually died with his head in a garbage can, drunk. My mom died of a heroin overdose. Point is, I was born on the wrong side of the law. I went to jail when I was 18, got out for a while, then went back to jail when I was 19, and after that, I went to prison, although there were couple of trips to mental hospitals mixed in there. Now, I tend to notice different types of personalities, and I automatically arrange people into different categories. It's a little easier to talk about prison guards here, correctional officers, because I got to observe them much more frequently. You only see police officers occasionally, but when you're in prison, you see the guards every day, so you can study them. Let me tell you about five different types of correctional officers. The same categories will apply to police officers. It's just harder to figure out which category a police officer is in because you don't see the police officers as much. 
First, there are CEOs who are only there because it's their job. Their goal is to earn a paycheck. They don't particularly care what you do as long as it doesn't interfere with them. So they do whatever they have to do as part of their job, but they don't go beyond that. They usually sit in the guard booth and read a newspaper. Second, there are CEOs who want everyone to think they're cool. They would come into the dorm and sit down and play cards with us. I remember one CEO who would walk into the dorm and yell, CEOs ain't woe. Some of you weren't around in 2000, but there was a Black Rob song where he said, your man ain't woe, the judge ain't woe, CEOs ain't woe, POs ain't woe. Some of you don't know what woe means. My videos are woe, no further definition needed. So this CEO would walk into the dorm yelling, CEOs ain't woe. These are the types of guards who acted like they were really on our side, not on the side of the state. At the extreme end of this type of CO, there were guards who would bring drugs and porn flicks into the prison. These guys clearly loved being able to go home in the evening and say to their wives, man, those guys love me in there. They know I'm just like one of them. So these guards like being liked. They want to fit in. They want to be down. The third and fourth types are COs who really believe in what they're doing. They're there to make a difference. They're trying to help, but they do this in different ways. A type three officer believes that he should be nice to inmates. He shows kindness. He shows compassion. He believes that inmates just took a bad turn in life, but that they can turn their lives around. So he asks how you're doing. He asks if you're okay. He asks how your family is doing. He asks if there's anything he can do to help you. He's always smiling. He encourages you. He cares. These COs are usually Christians. The fourth type of CO also believes in what he's doing. He's on a mission. He wants to make a difference. But he thinks that the best way to do this is by being strict. He believes that what inmates need in order to turn their lives around is discipline and order. Inmates need to learn that there are consequences for their actions. Inmates need a firm hand to guide them. So these guards are quick to come after you if you're breaking the rules. They're quick to write charges. But they don't lie about you. They're not trying to hurt you. Their hearts are in the right place. It's important to pay attention to the intentions of type 4 COs because if you're not paying attention to their intentions, it's easy to mistake them for the fifth type of CO. Type 5 COs are sadistic scumbags. They're garbage human beings. They're bad people with badges. Much like type 4 COs, these guys are quick to come after you. They're quick to write charges, but their intentions aren't the same. They're not there to make a difference. They're there because they really like having control over people. They like the power. They will lie about you. They'll crack your skull open for annoying them. They make sure on a daily basis that you understand that they can do anything they want to you and that there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. Those are five types of correctional officers. Again, police officers fall into the same categories. Now, if you had to guess, once a person has spent years in prison and he thinks about correctional officers, which type of correctional officer do you think will stand out most in his mind? That is, if you ask an inmate to think about prison guards, which type of guards is he going to think about? Is he going to think about guards who are just there for a paycheck, or guards who want to be down, or guards who are nice, or guards who are strict but well-meaning, or guards who are abusive scumbags who get off on tormenting people? I probably don't need to answer that for you. One of the most fundamental tasks of your brain is to protect you from danger. Your brain takes special note of threats. So the guards and the police that pose a threat stand out in your mind. You remember them more. Let me give you a few specific examples of what I mean. I could give many more examples, but I'm going to try to give examples of different kinds of negative encounters with COs and police in completely different situations, completely different locations, and even from different states. I was in jail 
19 years old, and I was fasting. I went day after day on nothing but water. I dropped from around 235 pounds down to around 150 pounds. The doctor was threatening to start tube feeding me. He said that my body would eventually run out of energy sources and that it would start feeding on my own heart muscle. And that once my body started cannibalizing my internal organs, they would force feed me through a tube. So the nurses kept giving me blood tests to see what my body was using for energy. On the way back from one of these trips to medical, I got into an elevator with a guard. To be fair, I'm pretty sure I had said something slick to him because I did that a lot. I don't remember what I said, but I know that I would quite frequently mess with guards. For instance, if a guard was giving me a a pat down, checking for weapons and such, I would sometimes pretend that he was giving me an erotic massage. If a guard had a mustache, I might say, it's time to make the donuts, in honor of the Dunkin' Donuts commercial from the 1980s. So, I tended to mess with the guards. I was always joking, nothing serious. And again, on this occasion, I don't remember what I said, but it wouldn't have been anything too terrible. When I stepped into the elevator with that guard, the door closed behind him, but we didn't go anywhere because he didn't push the button. Then he got right in my face. He was four or five inches shorter than me. And for the first time, I saw his eyes. This guy was clearly stoned out of his mind. His eyes were glazed over. His pupils looked like dots. He simultaneously looked like he was ready to fall asleep and like he was ready to rip my throat out. He got right in my face and he said, go ahead and move. Move any part of your body. Just move and see what happens. Now, you might not know what that meant to an inmate in that jail. But when the guards were doing shakedowns, when they would search the dorm or cells for contraband, they would take us out into the hall and make us get on our knees with our foreheads against the wall and our hands behind our backs while they threw all our stuff all over the place. It wasn't a comfortable position, but a guard would always announce any movement you make or any sound you make will be interpreted as an act of aggression against us. I once saw an inmate put that announcement to the test. We were on our knees with our foreheads against the wall and our hands behind our backs. And the guards warned us, any movement you make or any sound you make will be interpreted as an act of aggression. One guy, I used to play chess with him, one guy laughed pretty quietly and shook his head a little. The guards pounced on him. I couldn't look over there because if I had turned my head, it would have been interpreted as an act of aggression. But with my peripheral vision, I could see his dreadlocks flying around as the guards folded this guy up like they were doing origami. Never saw him again. Some of you are thinking, well, they warned him that they would interpret any sound or movement as an act of aggression, but that's not the point. Here's the point. Did they really think that him chuckling and shaking his head a little was an act of aggression? Of course not. They wanted to remind us that they were in charge and that they had complete power over us. And they proved their point. Back to the elevator. When this guard was daring me to move any part of my body, I knew what he meant. He meant that if I moved any part of my body, he was going to interpret it as an act of aggression. He was going to bash my head in and then say that I had attacked him. So I stood there, probably the most still I'd ever been in my entire life, and I stared at the wall while this guard taunted me. He finally pushed the button and we went back to my floor. The takeaway that day was that this man could do anything he wanted to me and that there was nothing I could do about it. That was a fairly new feeling for me. I'd had police and guards mess with me before, but their message had never been so perfectly clear. Now, in other circumstances in life, I always felt like I had a fighting chance. Even if seven people were attacking me, I would at least be allowed to fight back. Here, I wasn't allowed to defend myself. I wasn't allowed to move. I wasn't allowed to whisper. This man could do anything he wanted, and I would be the one who got in trouble for it. Some of you may be thinking, But David, 
you could have just informed his superiors that he was taunting you and that he was high on drugs. I have no clue what sort of fantasy world you live in. One, no one would ever believe me. Two, even if they did, this guy's fellow guards would never go after him. And three, if by some miracle I could get someone to go after him and this guy got in trouble, do you have any clue what the other guards would do to me? Some of you are also thinking, well, you shouldn't have messed with him. And that attitude is part of the problem. Me messing with a guard isn't supposed to mean that he can smash my face in and get away with it. There are rules. If I violate the rules, there's a process. He can write me a charge. What you find is that the guards don't have to follow the rules and that there's no accountability. We have to follow the rules. They don't. They're supposed to, but they don't really have to. They can break the rules all they want and they've got complete immunity because no one is going to call them out for what they're doing. One more thing about this brief encounter. If I had run into this man on the street, he wouldn't have dared to get in my face. I would have knocked all his teeth out. But he could get in my face on an elevator in a jail. He could have beat me senseless and given me an assault charge for it. Why did he have the power to do something that he couldn't have done on the street? Well, there was a system in place that gave him that power and that would protect him even if he broke the rules, right? So was my problem just with a stoned power tripping guard or was my problem also with the system that gave him the power to literally get away with murder under the right circumstances? Different occasion. I was in Central State Psychiatric Hospital. There was a room in my wing of the hospital. And in that room was the only man I've ever met who was completely psychotic. I've known other people who would snap and be temporarily psychotic, but this man was permanently, completely out of touch with reality and extremely violent. They had him in restraints most of the time, even though he was almost always locked in a room, not just because he would attack people when they opened the door, but also because he would crap all over the floor and then smear crap all over the walls. No one wanted to clean that up or smell it, so they would keep him in restraints and then periodically take him out to the restroom. One day, four guards were escorting this young man to the restroom. I didn't see what he did because I wasn't paying attention, but he somehow did something to one of the guards. He couldn't have done much because his hands were attached to his waist. Might have done something with his elbow, I don't know. But I looked over when one of the guards flipped out and started punching him in the face. These four guards then pinned the guy to the floor. Three of them held him down while one of them repeatedly punched this guy in the face. He kept punching him until one of the guards said, okay, that's enough. And he pulled the other guard off the guy and push the guard out of the room. Obviously, you might think that guards shouldn't be punching a man who's clearly out of touch with reality. But that's not the point here. Here's the point. After the guards put this young man back in his cell, I could hear the three guards. The other one who punched the guy was gone. The three guards were standing there making up a story. The doctors would notice that the patient's face was messed up. So the guards were there putting together a story about how this young man, unfortunately, had to get punched in the face repeatedly as he was fighting the guards. But I was right there. He was pinned to the floor by three guards while the other kept punching him in the face. But who gets to correct the guards' story? Mental patients? Of course not. There were some messed up people in that mental hospital. There were people who would be totally normal one minute and fly into a rage the next. Guess what? If you can't deal with that environment in an appropriate way, if you're the sort of person who's going to lose your temper and start punching an insane person in the face, you shouldn't be working there. But when your temperament is exposed, when you show that you can't control your temper, what do the other guards do? They cover for you. What was the message to the guard who pounded on the face of a mental patient. The message was, don't worry too much about getting violent with the patients because the other guards will lie for you. Fast forward several years. By this time, 
I was a Christian, and I was a much nicer person than I had been before. The place was St. Bride's Correctional Center. The time was about two months before my release date. I was in a 32-man dorm. A guard came into the dorm, Officer Lilliforn. My bunkmate, I don't remember his real name, his nickname was Cooney. My bunkmate was sitting on a chair beside my bunk. And when he saw Lilliforn, he said, man, this guy hates me, he's always messing with me. So he just sat there. Apparently someone annoyed Officer Lilliforn because he started yelling at everyone, bragging that he could put our dorm on lockdown, telling everyone that he was going to start handing out charges, reminding us that he could do whatever he wanted, blah, 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 blah. And as he turned to walk out of the dorm, he stopped and looked over at Cooney and said, and I've already got your number. Cooney was sitting right beside me the entire time. He hadn't done anything. A few hours later, some guards came in and took Cooney to the hole. He was charged with surrounding and intimidating an officer. Total nonsense. Now, they have little trials for these charges. You can appear as a witness at someone's trial. But it's generally understood that you don't want to go testify against an officer because if you do, that officer and all his friends are going to come after you. So people don't like to testify against COs. But I was thinking, what are they going to do to me? I wake up and sweep and mop the dorm. I clean the bathroom. Then I read for a few hours until I get tired of reading. Then I play a couple of games of spades. Then I read some more, do some push-ups. I read. What are the guards going to charge me with that would be at all believable? Everyone knows I'm not doing anything. So I went to Cooney's hearing. I told the judge. She's not an actual judge. I forget what she's called. She just decides whether the charges stick and what the penalty is. I told her that Cooney was sitting beside me the entire time. They didn't say anything, let alone surround and intimidate an officer. I pointed out that the charge was absurd on its face. How could one man surround someone? The only thing Lilliforn would say in response was, look, I'm not going to sit here and be called a liar by an inmate. I said, I'm in here for being violent, not for lying. If you don't want to be called a liar by an inmate, stop lying. Cooney was found guilty. My testimony against a lying correctional officer was completely worthless. That hearing was at night. The next day, I was at the sink in the dorm, and a man called Bebe, who was king of the inmates, the head shot caller, if you're trying to picture him, think Evander Holyfield, came up to me and said, Hey, Wood, you ain't telling nothing, is you? I said, No, my word before the Almighty, I ain't telling nothing. Bebe said, Well, that's good enough for me, but someone says you're telling. I said, Let's go pull up on him and we'll straighten it. And Bebe said, can't do that, because it ain't no inmate. It wasn't an inmate. Who was saying that I was a snitch? The guards were. So I testified that a guard was lying, because he was lying. And the guards responded by telling the prison chieftains that I was the prison snitch. And all I could think was, are you kidding me? I testify that you're lying because you're lying and you literally tried to get me killed? Guys, do you know what snitches are in prison? They're the lowest of the low. At the very bottom of the prison hierarchy, you've got rapists, child molesters, and underneath all that, snitches. Fortunately for me, I was bunkmates with Bebe for three or four months, so he knew me and he decided to ask me directly. But the guards didn't know that I knew Bebe, so they thought they could teach me a little lesson about testifying against one of them. And they did. They taught me that our lives are so utterly worthless to some of them that they will gladly get us murdered simply for exposing a pointless lie. Here again, should my problem just be with Officer Lilliforn? Or should I have a problem with the system that gives people like him the power to lie about inmates, and even to try to get us killed. New scenario. I got out of prison. 
I learned very quickly that no one wants to hire a convicted violent felon for obvious reasons. Every job application said, have you ever been convicted of a felony? If so, please explain. Might as well have said, have you ever been convicted of a felony? If so, please throw this application in the garbage. So I came up with a brilliant plan. I would become so amazingly educated that people would stop asking me if I've ever been convicted of a felony. I went to college. After college, I went to graduate school. In 2010, I had been out of prison 10 years. By this time, I was teaching philosophy of human nature and philosophical ethics at Fordham University. I was squeaky clean, model citizen. During the summer, I was in Dearborn, Michigan with my friend Nabil at the Arab International Festival. Nabil was a former Muslim. He was wearing a Christian t-shirt. Some young Muslims recognized him from YouTube, started asking him questions. How can you trust the Bible? How can you believe that Jesus is God? It was a friendly Q&A. Nabil was praising these young Muslims for their questions. I was about to invite them all to IHOP for pancakes. All of a sudden, police arrested us and threw us in jail. Not the Muslims who were asking questions, just us. The police report said that we were screaming at the crowd and that we were inciting a riot and that police had to arrest us for public safety. In reality, Nabil was politely answering questions and I was standing there with my mouth shut holding a camera so that no one could falsely accuse us of doing something that we didn't do. Turns out that the ones who falsely accused us were the police and the mayor and they confiscated my camera so that we couldn't prove they were lying when they told the media that we were screaming at people and causing a riot. We got bailed out by some friends the next morning now, as bad as it was that police arrested us for having a peaceful discussion on a public street, and as bad as it was that they would lie about us in order to justify throwing us in jail, the more glaring problem was this. If those police officers would lie in writing about what we did, even though we had video footage proving that they were lying, they must have had a lot of confidence that they could get away with lying. And if they would lie about something as insignificant as a misdemeanor charge of breach of peace when we could prove they were lying, what do you think these police officers would do if one of them shot an unarmed man and there were no cameras around? Do you think they'd lie to save their jobs? I do. Keep in mind, I'm talking about those particular cops if you lie about something as ridiculous as Christians having a public discussion with Muslims, I'm pretty sure you'd lie to protect yourself if you shot an unarmed man. I went back to the same area with three Christians the next day. I just went there to record because I had already seen how far the cops there were willing to go. I had to buy another camera because police had seized my other camera. The Christians were handing out copies of the Gospel of John in Arabic. Whatever you think about that, it's perfectly legal in the United States of America to offer people a copy of the Gospel of John. Three Christians were standing there all of two or three minutes handing out copies of the Gospel of John, and eight police officers surrounded them. I wasn't handing out anything. I was standing there with a camera, which is perfectly legal. A cop came up, and took my camera, and took us all into custody. They let us go a little later. Here the issue was that eight police officers rolled up on three Christians who were handing out copies of the Gospel of John, and yet it had never crossed any of these officers' minds to say, as they were on their way to get us, guys, should we really be stopping Christians from handing something out on a public sidewalk? And even if we decide to shut these Christians down, do we really need to roll up on them eight officers deep? Wouldn't two of us be enough? And is it really okay for us to walk up to someone who's recording, take his camera? There just seemed to be no respect whatsoever for anyone's rights. They did not care. It wasn't one officer, it was eight. There was once again a problem with the entire system. If I were to walk up to someone and try to take his camera away from him, it would be a crime. 
And the person with the camera would be allowed to defend himself and protect his property. But because these guys had badges, they could walk right up to me and take my property, and there was nothing I could do about it. Notice, this officer wasn't legally allowed to take my camera, but he did anyway, because like it or not, the system gives him the ability to do whatever he wants. If I had resisted or tried to protect my property, those officers would have beat me down and thrown me in jail, and I would have been the one in trouble when they were the ones who were breaking the law. And besides these kinds of issues, there was that additional implication. If these officers were willing to act like this over handing out Christian literature, what would they do if they really had it in for someone? Fast forward another few years. Different state. One of my brothers was on probation. He was renting a room in someone's house. Police raided the house and caught my brother with some drugs. That was both a crime and a violation of his probation. Should he be punished? Of course, that's justice. But police also found a number of guns in the house. They were legally owned, they belonged to the owner of the house and were in a locked gun safe. Police told my brother, you're not allowed to have guns in the house with you. We're charging you with felony gun possession for each firearm. My brother said, those aren't mine. They're the owner's guns. The owner of the house said, he has no access to those guns. They're mine and they're in my gun safe. He's just renting a room from me. Police said, too bad. According to the law, if the guns are in the house with him, he's responsible. So we're charging him with multiple gun felonies. Now, that is indeed the law. He can be charged for a gun in the house he lives in, even if he has nothing to do with the gun, and even if he has no clue that there's a gun there. It's the law. So the police think that it's a good idea to charge a man for possession of firearms that he's never actually possessed. Is that justice? Justice is hard to define, but it has something to do with people getting what they deserve for the things they've done. It seems to me that if you're going to be charged with multiple gun felonies, you should at least have some connection to the guns and that if the government punishes you for having guns you never once had, it's actually injustice. I look at that situation and I see injustice. There was an opportunity for justice. When one of my brothers is on drugs, I'm actually kind of glad when he gets locked up. He's not going to OD in prison. But when police come after my brother for something that he had absolutely nothing to do with just because they can, what am I supposed to think? My family is being punished for something he had nothing to do with, and it's the law. Am I supposed to point a finger at a specific police officer? It's not just the police officer. It's the prosecuting attorneys. It's the judges. It's the people who make the laws. They're all responsible for designing a system that doesn't bring about justice. It brings about a mixture of justice and injustice. But when the system produces injustice, there's nothing you can do about it. I've never been mad at the system for punishing someone justly. I get mad at the system for screwing someone unjustly. If justice is getting what you deserve and the system punishes people unjustly, it seems like the system should be punished. But the system never gets punished. So the injustice keeps building and building and building year after year after year. And the anger of the victims of the system also keeps building and building and building year after year after year. Now, in your community, you might not know anyone who's ever been screwed by the system. The worst thing that a police officer has ever done to you may be that he could have let you off with a warning, but he gave you the speeding ticket anyway. But guess what? There are entire communities where everyone, and I mean everyone, has either been screwed unjustly by the system or they know someone very close to them who's been screwed unjustly by the system. Everyone in the community has either been a victim of the system or is very close to someone who's been a victim of the system. Everyone in the community has been impacted by the injustice, so the entire community has been victimized by the system. Keep in mind, I'm not talking about people being punished justly. I'm talking about people being punished unjustly. I can give you a lot of examples of police officers and correctional officers crossing lines that should not be crossed. But there are tons of people 
who've had far worse experiences with police officers and correctional officers than I or my brothers have ever had. There are people who are listening to me thinking, these are the things that you're complaining about? I've seen way worse than that. And there's something that we might call communal memory. These are the memories of a community, not just the memories of some individual. The community remembers how its members have been treated by police. If they've been treated unjustly and unfairly by police, then we end up with communal anger. The entire community is angry at police. But what can they do? They can't do anything. So the anger keeps boiling in the pot until something eventually makes it overflow. And now you're ready to understand why some people hate cops. Here are a few points to consider. First, when a police officer makes you realize that he can do whatever he wants to you and that there's nothing you can do about it, that feeling never goes away. It grows weaker over time, but it doesn't go away. It becomes a part of you and it affects your view of police and of the system that puts police in a position to make you feel that way. Let me tell you from personal experience how this affects you. I've had tons of positive interactions with correctional officers and with police officers. I've had friends who are police officers. I have five sons. Two of my sons have a genetic muscle disease. They're on life support. When we lived in the Bronx, we would occasionally have a medical emergency. Hello, 911, my son's heart just stopped. My wife's doing CPR. Police would be at our apartment in all of 90 seconds, rolling in like the cavalry, clearing a path for paramedics. They were awesome. So if I think carefully, I can think of all kinds of wonderful police officers. But there are very different parts of the human mind, and these different parts can want different things. For instance, part of you can want to do your work, while another part of you wants to play video games. When I hear that police had to flee their own police department in an attempt to calm a violent protest, part of me thinks, that's terrible. This country's falling apart. Who's going to protect the people in that area? But another part of me thinks, wait a minute. Someone just ran the cops out of their own precinct? <laughs> wow, someone took your precinct. I don't want to think like that. I don't want to think that it's funny. I'm just telling you how these things affect you. Second, human beings have an internal justice o meter an internal scorecard. We don't like it when people get away with doing something wrong. So if individual police officers, as well as the entire system, keep getting away with various injustices, there will always be something inside of the people who are aware of what's happening that cries out for justice. But justice never comes. This breeds resentment. Third, I haven't even mentioned the issue of race. Everything I've said has been about messed up cops doing messed up things. I'm white. My brothers are white. Well, they're a quarter Latino, but they look plain white. Their dad was half Nicaraguan. Interestingly, their dad died jumping off a bridge running from the police. Like me, my brothers were born on the wrong side of the law. But think about this. The kinds of interactions I'm talking about with police officers and correctional officers, where they make it clear that they have complete power and control over you. Those kinds of interactions feel different if they're between a white officer and a black suspect or inmate. Think about the elevator example. That was a white guard taunting a white inmate daring me to move any part of my body or to say anything so that he could smash my face in and then add two years to my sentence. White officer, white inmate. The issue of race never entered my mind. But if that had been a black inmate in that elevator, it would have felt a little different to the black inmate. A white officer treating a black inmate like the black inmate is complete garbage who can be beaten senseless at any moment would feel different to the black inmate than it would to a white inmate. A white officer reminding a black inmate that he has complete control over him and basically owns him would come across differently. It would feel like there's a racial component to the encounter. So here's the thing. I don't know of anyone who says that there aren't any racist police officers. There are obviously 
some racist police officers. How is a racist police officer or a racist correctional officer going to treat a black suspect or a black inmate? It's going to treat the black suspect or the black inmate like he's inferior. But there are police officers and correctional officers who treat suspects and inmates in general like they're inferior. From the perspective of the black suspect or inmate, the police officer or correctional officer who treats him like garbage because of his race is indistinguishable from the police officer or correctional officer who treats him like garbage for some other reason. Do you see the point? A white officer treating me like garbage would not come across as racist. The only explanation that would enter my mind would be that the white officer is a power tripping dirtbag. But a white officer treating a black man like garbage would come across as racist. The communal memory of the racist encounters of the past would affect the way the encounter is interpreted. What does this mean? It means that in a black community, there are encounters with racist police officers, and there are encounters with police officers who may not be racist, but who come across as racist because the way they treat a black suspect looks exactly like the way a racist cop would treat a black suspect. So the experience of a black community with police officers ends up being racially charged in a way that the experience of a white community usually isn't. Keep in mind, my point here is separate from the issue of systemic racism. When you hear about systemic racism in the criminal justice system, the claim is that if you're a black man or a black woman facing the criminal justice system, you're at a disadvantage. This can refer to all kinds of things. If possession of a drug that's more common in the black community is punished more severely than possession of a drug that's more common in the white community, then the system is already favoring one race over another. Now, I haven't studied the issue of systemic racism, so I'm not going to comment one way or another. I generally don't talk about things that I haven't studied. I'm making the separate point that the black community has to deal with at least some actual racists, but that type five police officers, police officers who treat people like garbage, are going to come across as racists because they treat black suspects the same way a racist police officer would treat black suspects. So these encounters are going to be racially charged. Fourth, as I noted at the beginning, there are different types of police officers. Some police officers are quite noble. Some police officers will take a bullet for people they don't even know. But when someone in a victimized community thinks about police officers, which type of police officers are they going to think about? The nice police officers who want to make a difference or the scumbag police officers who took their father or mother or brother or sister or son or daughter or husband or wife away on a bogus charge that seems racially motivated. I told you that when I think of police officers and correctional officers, I tend to think of the worst examples. Again, your brain is designed to protect you from harm. So it takes special note of threats, especially threats to your life, threats to your future, threats to your family, and so on. But in the black community, there's the added dimension of racial tension because the police officers who treat suspects like garbage come across as racist, whether they're racist or not. Those are the police officers that stand out most in the minds of people who've had those experiences. Those are the police officers that the community remembers. The community does not forget them. Fifth, when you're part of a community, that views police as the enemy, you start to view police as the enemy. When I got out of prison, I did not like cops. And it wasn't just because of particular bad experiences. I had been in an environment for years where it was us versus them. Police were the enemy, COs were the enemy. That's how it is in prison, and that's how it is in certain communities. There are communities where they view police as the enemy, destroyers of lives, destroyers of families. If you live in one of those communities, it affects you. You grow up thinking of police as the enemy, but your enemy is invincible. There's no way to defeat your enemy because your enemy has all the power. Your enemy can throw you in jail at will. Your enemy can break up your family at will. 
the prosecuting attorneys and the judges will side with your enemy because they're the enemy too. You are totally powerless and helpless before an invincible foe. Not a good feeling. Sixth, imagine you're in a community that views police as the enemy, a community that remembers decades worth of injustices that have been carried out by police. You remember when police made you feel completely powerless and inferior. You remember the feeling of not being allowed to so much as defend yourself against what they were doing. One day, you turn on the news and you see a police officer kneeling on the neck of a man who's telling the police officer, I can't breathe. The police officer doesn't seem to care at all. The man on the ground is completely helpless. If anyone other than a police officer were kneeling on his neck, he would be allowed to defend himself and other people would be allowed to step in and help him. But because there are badges involved, because these men have the seal of the system on their chests, all that man can do is slowly die, calling out for his mother who passed away years earlier. And no one standing around can intervene because if they intervene, police will treat them the same way. Most of you don't come from a community that views police as the enemy. So when you saw George Floyd killed, you probably thought to yourself, well, that's peculiar. That officer is a bad apple. Other people from different communities saw the same thing, but they thought to themselves, police putting a man in a position where they have complete control over him and where he's not even allowed to defend himself? That's what they do. Finally, imagine once again that you're in a community that views police as the enemy, an invincible enemy, an enemy that has made you feel powerless for decades. Imagine that all of a sudden you have the opportunity to turn the tables and make the police feel helpless. Imagine a police officer doing something that serves as a spark that ignites all of the anger and resentment that have been building for decades. Imagine, for once, being able to make police officers feel the way that they've been making you feel all your life. What would you do? Well, that depends on what kind of person you are. There are different kinds of police officers because there are different kinds of people. There are people who seek popularity. They want to show how cool they are. Have you seen people who are using the death of George Floyd for their own personal aggrandizement? Of course you have, you've been on Twitter. Then there are people who genuinely want to make a difference, either through love and compassion or through firmness and resolve. These are the people who are out protesting. And there are total scumbags. These are the people who are taking advantage of the situation, people who are weaponizing the anger and resentment for their own agendas that have nothing to do with George Floyd. So, do you understand why some people hate police officers? Do you understand why some people become enraged at the entire police force and the entire criminal justice system when a particular officer kills someone? Let me know what you think in the comments section. Now, I haven't made any suggestions as to solutions, but we need to solve this problem because as you can see, it's only getting worse. I would say that at a bare minimum, three changes need to be made. One, lawmakers need to deal with injustice in the law. When the law says that you can punish someone for something that he had nothing to do with, or that crimes can be punished beyond what's fair and just, the law needs to be fixed. I would recommend that lawmakers sit down with community representatives and go through these issues so that the lawmakers can come to understand why people in the community view the system as racist. Two, we hear about reforming the system. The system needs to be designed so that a certain type of police officer is weeded out of the system doesn't have to be weeded out entirely. The type five police officers can work at a desk or something, but they can't be sent out as representatives of the criminal justice system into communities that they're going to abuse. 
Personality tests need to be geared towards spotting these guys. Performance reviews need to be geared towards spotting these guys. Get rid of cops who make people hate cops. Three, people need a positive way to vent their anger before the anger erupts. When a police officer does something wrong to someone, there isn't much the people in the community can do about it until something triggers protests and riots. It wouldn't be terribly difficult to come up with some intermediate options. Suppose the chief of police has a monthly meeting with the local community and that people from the community are welcome to come in and voice their grievances directly to the chief of police so that if officer so-and-so curb stomps your brother in front of your entire family, you know that there's a time and a place where you can call out officer so-and-so for what he did and that your complaints will be taken seriously. Obviously, the chief of police can't believe every complaint, but over time, he or she will start to notice some patterns with abusive officers. Bottom line, police and the community they police need to start viewing each other as friends rather than enemies, and that's just not going to happen until some changes are made. All right, hats off to you if you watch this all the way through. In fact, let me know in the comments section if you watched the entire video. Not my normal topic, but in case you haven't noticed, this is now affecting everyone. Let's take the power away from abusive police officers, and let's take the power away from people who want to use decades worth of anger and frustration and resentment for their own agendas. There are tyrants lining up on all sides, but this is the United States. Tyrants aren't welcome here.